Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to be here today. I usually don't speak in churches, and uh, it's not my first time that I speak in a church. Uh, I had one lecture in one church already, but that will stay a secret. Uh, but I must reveal you at the very beginning another secret. Uh, when I was still a kid, uh, younger than a teenager, I actually always thought of uh, studying theology. Uh, because as many, as many children, uh, I was always interested uh, not only in God, but mainly, generally speaking, in the meaning of the universe. Uh, in the meantime, I studied philosophy and linguistics, and as you can see, I ended up in the church anyhow speaking about the apocalypse. So, it sounds like a Woody Allen movie, and it is a Woody Allen movie. Uh, there is a beautiful scene, I mean, there are many beautiful scenes in Woody Allen's Any Hall. I guess you all remember this movie with uh, Woody Allen and with Diane Keaton, uh, where Woody Allen, there is a scene, where, scene when Woody Allen, his name is Alvi in the movie, is, uh, you know, he's kind of depressed, and his mother brings him to a psychiatrist. Uh, and at the psychiatrist, Alvi, Woody Allen is a small kid and so on, and mother says to the psychiatrist, uh, you know, my, my kid is depressed and he doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't even want to go to school. And uh, then the psychiatrist turns to Alvi and asks, of course, but why are you depressed? And Alvi responds, the universe is expanding. And the mother, like now, is already completely crazy and mad, lost her temper completely, and asks him, but what do you mean by that? And then Woody Allen says, well, the universe is everything, and if it's expanding, someday it will break apart, and that will be the end of everything. And then mother is like completely upset and says, Alvi, what what, what's that of your business? You should think about school and so on. And Alvi responds, but what's the point if the world is ending? And then the mother says, what does it have to do with it? you have to do your homework, you are here, you are in Brooklyn. So instead of thinking about the end of the world, think about Brooklyn today. And then at the end of this scene, you have the psychiatrist who is smoking like a cigarette and says, yes, yes, you just have to think about Brooklyn, you are here, we have to enjoy our lives. And I really like this scene because uh, it was shot, I think, when Annie Hall was the 70s or something like that. Uh, but if you remember, what was the first reaction towards the children's climate protest all across the world when it started one year ago? Well, you could have read Angela Merkel, Theresa May, Vladimir Putin, and although there are many differences between these world leaders, the reaction was the same as the mother's reaction and as the psychiatrist's reaction. So the kids were saying, you know, everything is collapsing. What you can see is that in the next 20, 30 years, you will have sea levels rising, you will have millions of refugees, climate refugees coming from the global south, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, and so on. You already have microplastics, as I heard, you have it also here. I mean, I didn't understand much, uh, 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 but I guess there is an exhibition uh, taking place. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that you already eat microplastics, that we all already eat microplastics. The scientists have found microplastics uh, in the Arctic, that they have found it in Swiss Alps and so on. So basically what the kids are saying, look, at the Amazon is burning if you continue to drill oil and fossil, use fossil fuels and so on, we are heading towards the end of the world. And what did Merkel, Putin and all the world leaders say? They say, go back to school. Like, what's the point, you know, if... Uh, 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 that, that's the question of the kids. That's what Greta posed as well, because Greta herself, if you remember, said that she was pretty depressed when she was thinking about the end of the world constantly. And then, of course, everyone said, but what's, what's the point, you know, to go to school even, if this is happening? And that's happening with this scene in, in Woody Allen. Uh, but today, it's not only the kids anymore. Look what's happening in Chile. Look what's happening in Ecuador. Look what's happening in Iraq with the pro massive protest in Baghdad. Look what's happening in Algiers. Look what's happening in Hong Kong. I just came from London yesterday. Look what happened in London and in the UK during the last months. And I'm not talking about Brexit. I'm talking about a movement which directly brings us into the topic of today's speech, which is the apocalypse, a movement whose name is Extinction Rebellion. 
I don't know whether you watched 12 Monkeys, that great movie, uh, uh, where you have this kind of scenario, you know, ecologists fighting, you have the graffiti and so on, and here you have Extinction Rebellion. So it's also protests in London, or go back to France. For months already, uh, you have a movement which is called Gila Jones. And we can approach them from different perspectives. You can criticize them, you can say it's not leading anywhere and so on, but they are a reflection, a consequence on a system which is producing an ecological apocalypse. It is a consequence in the same way that the Chile protests were not about 30 pesos, you know, that they increased the, the, the price for the public transport and then the people uh, are protesting. It is a consequence of 30 years of neoliberalism and Chicago boys running the Chilean economy, economy since Pinochet. So what you can see here is that we are approaching dangerous time today. People are reacting from the children's movement to Extinction Rebellion to all these heterogeneous movements which are now all across the world. And at the same time, what you can see today is that a certain apocalyptic zeitgeist, I would call it zeitgeist, I hope it makes sense in Dutch, it makes in German, certainly, a certain apocalyptic zeitgeist is all around us. And not only a zeitgeist, but what you can see now, and basically what I want to do today, since I didn't study theology, uh, uh, is to give a philosophical reflection on the notion of the apocalypse. A reflection on the notion of the apocalypse as something which is inherently, immediately, already part of ideology, of a certain narrative, of, if you want, even commodification. Last week, and maybe uh, I just need a glass of water, I don't know how do you do it in a church, and don't get a wine or something, but I would really love a, a glass of water if it's possible, and someone to tell me what's the time, because that I also don't know. And it's a bit complicated here in Utrecht, because the, the rings are the bells are ringing constantly, so like, you don't even know whether... So either ring the bell or someone tells me, and a glass of water. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, what you have today when we speak about the apocalypse is definitely, I would say, on the one hand, you have the reality. But this is still not the apocalypse, and basically, as you probably know, since we are in a church, the apocalypse has to be understood as a revelation, not as the end of the world. What you have today is that news magazines, even books and so on, are usually identifying the apocalypse with the end of the world. Uh, but I think what we have to examine is precisely the apocalypse as the revelation. So on the one hand, you have the reality, uh, the dystopian reality. Could it be said that this reality is already a sort of revelation? microplastics, uh, ice melting, uh, nuclear catastrophes, and so on. So on the one level, you have the facts, you have the reality. You have uh, 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 not only, uh, you know, apocalyptic uh, uh, maniacs, uh, prophets, kids saying that we are certainly going into a direction of, of the end of the world. You have, thanks a lot, uh, you have, and it's water, thanks, <laughs> not wine. Uh, so, we are going in that direction just if you look at the facts, according to the scientists. On the other hand, you have, uh, you have a narrative, a narrative about the apocalypse, and on the third hand, I would say you have a commodification of the apocalypse. So to, say, to, to explain what it means, uh, let's take, before we come to, to, to this church itself and to another church which was burning recently, let's take the example of Chernobyl. So I guess many of you here have watched the HBO series Chernobyl, right? No? Can people just... Have, yeah, how many of you did watch it? How many of you did hear about it? Okay, almost everyone. Uh, and this proves, kind of proves the point that uh, the topic of the end of the world is becoming something which is really a popular topic, which doesn't just mean that it's a popular topic, it means that it's a topic which is diving deeply into the collective unconscious uh, uh, of all of us. The very fact that most of you watched it, uh, not most of you, but that everyone heard about it, tells something not so much about the TV series, but about yourself. And it says something about the moment in which we are today. So last week, I, I happened to be in Chernobyl. 
in Pripyat and then the exclusion zone. And basically all the, all the levels of approaching the notion of apocalypse you can see there. So on the one hand you have the uh, dystopian reality, which is brutal facts, uh, which is on the one hand an exclusion zone of 30 kilometers where almost no one lives, although that's also not kind of true, here you already approach ideology. You have resettlers, you have workers in the Chernobyl power plant, and so on and so on. And basically, but okay, that's, let's say the reality is there is still a lot of radioactivity there. Uh, you have to be careful in which direction you, uh, you walk, you always have a Geiger around you, and so on. And according to the guides, it's less, if you stay one day in Chernobyl, it's less radioactivity than an intercontinental flight. Uh, what you can also see is the reality in the sense that a city which was populated by 50,000 people, like Pripyat, is now a ghost city, nature came back, and so on. Uh, but here you already approach the ideological level of the notion of the apocalypse. So first of all, the very name of Chernobyl, of this uh, site, is uh, Exclusion Zone, uh, which uh, is already ideological in the sense that Basically, what did you do? I mean, it's the same as you did in colonialism, not you as Dutch, but uh, everyone. Uh, 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 and what they did during the Yugoslav Wars, you know, when Milosevic and Tuđman, I'm not blaming you Dutch, I can, I can blame my, I, our compatriots as well. When Milosevic and Tuđman and Izetbegovic come together and they have a map and then they, 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 they you know, they, they, they draft, uh, draw the lines of the future countries and the territories. I mean, that's being done in, during colonialism in a much more sinister way as well. So, in the case of Chernobyl, you also have someone who makes, uh, 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 basically, they counted the Chernobyl explo explosion as a sort of nuclear bomb, and then you have to draw a 30 kilometers exclusion zone. But that's already ideology, the very term exclusion zone. Because what's happening outside is that you have villages outside, and especially on the Belarusian border, uh, uh, where thousands and thousands of people actually were affected by radioactivity uh, and they were never, uh, they were never, how to say, they were never put out of that territory. So you can already see ideology there. Then once you enter Pripyat, actually when you enter the exclusion zone, there is a first checkpoint. And what do you see there? There you see the, what I call the commodification of apocalypse. Commodification in the meaning that the apocalypse becomes something uh, objectified, something that can be sold, something that is commercialized, uh, something that becomes a product. So when you come to the checkpoint there, you can buy ice cream, which says like enjoy ice cream because you're going to Chernobyl or something like that. Uh, then you can buy souvenirs, you can buy t-shirts, uh, you can buy whatever you want basically. And once you come in, uh, it's also interesting because in 2014, and this is correct, directly connected to the, to, the, to the TV series as well, uh, and the apocalyptic, or more precisely, post-apocalyptic uh, uh, zeitgeist. Uh, so in 2014, it was 5,000 people uh, visiting the exclusion area. Last year, it was around 60,000. And last week, when I was there, it was around 80,000 already. Uh, and they think that next year, because the HBO series will only then hit like even more uh, uh, the global market, uh, uh, what else, uh, that it might be double and so on. Uh, there are, of course, other places in the world uh, which are, uh, which are you know, becoming an object of dark tourism, of post-apocalyptic tourism. And the question is why? Why is the apocalypse becoming suddenly something which is becoming part of our unconscious. So I guess most of you probably remember when the Notre Dame, a beautiful church, an important historical church, an important religious uh, uh, site, uh, was caught by fire in, in April this year. Uh, well, it was a, this kind of event which uh, pr those of you who are a bit older remember, <laughs> that means that I'm also getting old, uh, 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 remember 9-11. Who knows, maybe Greta and, uh, and the children of her age don't perceive that event in the same way we perceive it, but definitely for, for our generation that event was the event, uh, which was uh, a kind of event which had well, certainly global, maybe even universal value. 
Uh, when it comes, you know, you can just test yourself. You can probably, if you remember the moment, where have you been, with whom, what have you been doing, and so on, uh, when the when you know when when the planes smash the twin tower. And I would say the same goes for the Notre Dame, with one little exception, which we will now examine. Uh, most of you here, all of you here, probably remember right where you have been when the Notre Dame was caught by fire. Uh, you probably also remember the deep anxiety which you felt. Uh, you probably also remember all the questions you posed. Is it, you know, I remember because I was just flying, unfortunately, uh, uh, flying into Berlin, where I would live there the next month after the Notre Dame, not connected, but anyhow. And I remember, you know, you come to the bus of the airport, you open your, your, your mobile phone, and then it's like, I don't know, like Alpha. Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men or a movie where something happens and suddenly everyone takes the phones out and I look around the bus and everyone is having a phone, still don't know what's happening and then suddenly I see that everywhere there is a video of the Notre Dame burning and I get messages, so did you see it, did you see it? And then the first reaction of course, you know, what's, I cannot say, what's happening, you know, is it a terrorist attack? Is it this, is it that, and so on and so on. Uh, so, I would say that the Notre Dame, for instance, immediately also got itself caught in the post-apocalyptic zeitgeist, that uh, also the Notre Dame itself became part of a bigger narrative. And it actually reflects something uh, uh, of the collective unconscious, if you want, which is now uh, uh, prevailing in the world. Uh, it's interesting that in 2019, uh, in September, so two months ago, uh, there was an article in the Financial Times which started by the following sentence. This is not Chernobyl. <laughs> so, okay. There's an article in the Financial Times about the Notre Dame, and it starts with the sentence, this is not Chernobyl. How did we come there? Why is Notre Dame compared to Chernobyl? Uh, and you see that the architect, uh, so it was a hot summer in Paris. Uh, so this summer in 2019, June, July, August, September, were the hottest ever in recorded human history. October now was always the, also the hottest ever, and we are approaching a November, which might become the hottest uh, summer uh, in, in hu recorded in human history as well. So September, when uh, the journalist of the Financial Times visits uh, uh, the, the, the site of, 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 of Notre Dame, uh, it's 36 degrees, 36 degrees in September, maybe in the future, no one will be anymore wondering about the temperature, and no one is, because as you can see, this reality is also being normalized. Uh, and uh, she goes around the site with the architect, uh, uh, who is called Philippe Villeneuve, who is also who is the head of restoration of the Notre Dame. And basically, his sentence, this is not Chernobyl, was referring to the fact that when the church was burning, a lot of lead was you know, the metal was, uh, uh, was ev evaporated in the sky. And then, the, you know, the, if you remember the yellow, yellowish, mainly yellowish, uh, orange, uh, uh, reddish, uh, red uh, 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 smoke, which you saw above the Notre Dame, <laughs> it is a consequence of this metal burning. Uh, which is also interesting, I don't know, for those of you who watch the HBO series, you probably remember that uh, at one point, when the uh, reactor number four blows up, uh, uh, you also have uh, uh, a light above. I mean, even it's much better shown if you watch a documentary, documentary recordings of that event. You can see it even to a certain degree. But in the in the series, you have people coming on a bridge, which is in the movie in the series called the Bridge of Death, and they watch, you know, and you as a spectator, you know that, well, this is not just a beautiful sublime act. It's radioactivity being released. Uh, of course, when you come to Chernobyl now as a tourist, uh, uh, the guide will tell you first that when you pass the bridge that they hate to call it, she's an Ukrainian, uh, to call it uh, the bridge of death. Uh, uh, and that is already ideology uh, because people never stood on the bridge and watched this. But anyhow, what brings this together, Chernobyl in Paris, and this is not only the fact that the architect said, uh, uh, that the architect said, uh, that this is Chernobyl because Notre Dame is basically toxic. Uh, he said, I mean, only if you lick the ground around the Notre Dame, you can, you, can, you can end up in hospital, but it is still toxic. 
It is not toxic in the same way as, as, as Chernobyl. But what brings them together as well is something else. What brings them together is what Immanuel Kant would call the sublime. Uh, if you remember, in, in, in Kant, he has a, I cannot quote it now, but uh, 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 I will try to describe it, explain it. Uh, he has this beautiful image of a storm coming and, you know, and as, you know, as a small human being, you look at the storm and it, it's at the same time frightening, but it's at the same time exciting in a way. Uh, uh, I mean, you have it in, 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 in that's why in, you have it in Sjörn Kierkegaard as well. And that's why this is, you know, the kid, the kids today, the kid in Woody Allen's Any Hall, and this kind of, and the sublime, I would say as well, uh, brings us closer to the metaphysics of, of the apocalypse, I would say, in the sense that uh, uh, it, it's already existentialism, I would say, and existentialism is certainly back today in the 21st century. Uh, uh, what Kierkegaard says is that, you know, when you are on the, on the edge, like this, of, of a cliff, and you look down, and everyone knows this kind of experience, and you look down, and it's, at the same time, you're frightened, but you might even want to jump. You know, it's, it's this kind of feeling. And I think most of us felt something like that, even if it's a blasphemy to say, uh, even with 9-11, even with the Notre Dame, and certainly with watching Chernobyl, uh, 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 you know, a world without people. There is a certain fascination uh, uh, with something what I would call the post-apocalyptic sublime. sublime. Uh, uh, and that's something which brings uh, uh, Notre Dame and Chernobyl, again, in the same, uh, in the same context. So the experience of this sort of surplus, I would call it surplus reality, a reality that is literally too much reality, like when you watch 9-11, when you watch the Notre Dame, when you watch a tornado, uh, 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 it's too much reality. It almost feels like as if it is not real. Like, I don't know if you remember, because my brain is more and more stru structured as, as a Twitter subconscious or unconscious, so it's functioning like that. If you remember, there was a, a, a video when, uh, uh, w was it Etna, but a volcano in Italy was erupting and some friends are on a boat and it's erupting, and then they are filming, of course, themselves, and so on, and then one of them says, oh, this feels like, it's a, it's as if I'm in a movie. You know, you have this already that, I mean, especially movies can show that the apocalypse is, apocalypse is certainly something which gets into the unconscious, but at the same time, it's too much reality. It, it is as if we saw it in the, in, in the movies, and it is as if we are acting in the movie itself. Uh, so it's, it's not just an experience of a singularity in which the universal becomes concrete, uh, when the reality, namely the universal in the sense that the reality suddenly becomes a whole, which you can understand as a whole. It is also the moment when the historical, Notre Dame is burning, for instance, becomes the personal. I am landing to Berlin and I see all these people and so on, and my partner sends me a message, did you see what happened with Notre Dame, and add any other, any other scenario. <clears throat> and at the same time, the personal, if you imagine, again, if you, if you remember, <coughs> sorry, if you remember that recording of people in front of the Notre Dame singing, beautifully singing, while the smoke is going above the Notre Dame, this is when the personal becomes historical at the same time. You know, uh, 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 it already happened with 9-11, I think, but 9-11 was still the first truly global television event, I would say. I mean, you already had people filming it and then someone was doing a comment, but I would say the Notre Dame was truly a social media event, uh, where you can see how the personal, personal becomes the historical, how the personal becomes the universal. And you're already at the level of, of, of a narrative. And if you're at the level of a narrative, uh, uh, you're coming to the level of ideology. Uh, so I remember very well when after, from the Tegel airport, I came to, to my new apartment in Berlin and opened my computer and just searched what, was, what, was, what, what the hell was happening in Paris. Uh, is it another terrorist attack? Is it something else? Is it apocalypse? Whatever. Uh, I, I found an article in New York Times, uh, which was the perfect embodiment of, well, 
a certain ideological perspective. Uh, the, the, the title of the article was the Fire at Notre Dame Cathedral Leads to Expressions of Heartbreak Across the World. Fire at Notre Dame Cathedral Leads to ex Expressions of Heartbreak Across the World. Uh, so the article observed that uh, the fire that tore down torch through Notre Dame generated an outpouring of grief, this is a quote in France, and around the world as the symbol of French culture and history burned. So as I was reading this New York Times article, I was just imagining other people in other corners of the world. Not in Berlin, not in Paris, uh, uh, not in, in Europe. For instance, I was imagining uh, parts of the world in Africa, Mali, Senegal, Western Africa, countries which were under the French colonial rule. Were they also heartbroken in the same way New York Times said that everyone in the world was heartbroken? You know, I was imagining people from Yemen, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands. Were they also heartbroken? You know, by this, posing these questions, I'm not saying that it's not a tragedy. It is a tragedy, definitely, but the problem is that it's a fake universal, if you want to put it like that. It's a universal for it's the universalism of the West and a certain religious, social, political tradition which sees the burning of the Notre Dame as universal. So already here you can see ideology. Uh, unlike New York Times, the Al Jazeera offered a much needed counterpart to the Eurocentric narrative in an article which was titled Notre Dame and the case of misplaced empathy. And the case of misplaced empathy posing the question why is it that a Catholic cathedral in flames provokes more public grieving than the mass suffering and death of humans? And it's an important question. Not only because it enables us to rethink the empathy felt towards a building, uh, which certainly has a historical, religious, and even personal value, uh, but also because it shifts, shifts the perspective uh, from the Eurocentric fascination with the West monuments and our own tradition. What about all the destroyed ancient monuments, not only in ISIS, but by Western military interventions in Iraq, Afghanistan? What about all the destroyed monuments uh, in Latin America when the colonialists came? Uh, or what about ancient forms of imperialism, like when Carthage destroyed, was destroyed by the Romans, or Persepolis destroyed, was destroyed by Alexander the Great? Or what about natural catastrophes, like when the library of Alexandria was burning, or for instance, the most famous that was, a, uh, well, I think it's, a very, it's becoming an even more relevant theologian discussion than it was, maybe the, the, the Lisbon earthquake. You know, when you have this kind of events, you could even say for the Lisbon earthquake that it was a universal event, uh, but again, I tempt to the, I, I, I'm tempted to go in the direction to say that this was also a Western or Westernized universal event. Uh, 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 or take this church, for instance. To be honest, I didn't know much about this church, uh, but uh, I always follow the, the, the motto of Frederick Jameson, uh, the great Amer American cultural scholar, who says, always historicize. Always historicize in the sense that uh, 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 try to find what Hegel would call the concrete universal. Try to find something which uh, uh, connects you to the place in which you are at the moment, geographically, but also temporally. So basically in linguistics, I mean already in Desosir you have two levels. One is uh, synchrony and the other one is diachrony. Like you have two with this uh, syntagma syntagmatic level and paradigmatic level in the sense that uh, 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 you have all the words which are here in time as you speak, but you also have something like philology, which goes and examines words in history. I'm simplifying linguistics now, of course. I speak for hours just about that. But the point is that you try to cognitively map yourself in the moment where you are. Uh, so, I'm in the moment that I need another glass of water, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, we are in a church. Uh, what brings this church in direct correlation to, to what I was just talking about, about this universalism and the narrative of the apocalypse, uh, well, are several events. This church, as I found out yesterday when I arrived, uh, uh, also was caught by fire. Uh, uh, this church, if you can believe it, was damaged by a tornado. 
Although it's not really tornado now, by, by according to the recent scientific uh, 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 reflections, how to call it, it was a, a how did they call it, bow echo. Bow echo, right? I don't know, echo bow, something like that. Uh, yeah, bow echo. Uh, so, but what is interesting uh, is that uh, uh, it came in 1674. Uh, those of you who know Dutch history better than me, you already know that this is a period which is well, quite, I'm in a church, I cannot say fucked up, but uh, it's, uh, it is from the perspective of, uh, uh, of the people who are living there, and especially from the Dutch perspective. Uh, in 1672, that was the year of, of you know, of what, what, what in Dutch history is called the disaster year. You know, it is a year where you already, you're, you are in war, Utrecht was completely uh, uh, bankrupt, destroyed, uh, 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 you have tensions with French, with Germany, with, with the Brits and so on. And then two years later, for this ill-prepared community city, which is already plundered and already in a, in a, in a state of crisis, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, I give you this. Sorry, I just, my, I'm, I'm a bit sick because I was in Chernobyl, so radio, it's, it's radioactivity. Uh, no, but it was very cold in Kiev and, and, and there, yeah. But maybe it is radioactivity. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the thing with radioactivity, that it's really scary because you don't see it, you know? Uh, uh, which gives a completely different perspective on the very notion of apocalypse. And this is why Gunther Anders, for instance, one of my favorite German philosophers uh, spoke about the nuclear age as the last epoch. The last epoch, because if, if, if you really understand the consequences of nuclear energy or what happened, of, or what might happen, like do you know that France now is planning to build uh, seven, six or seven new major nuclear reactors? And it's a country which is already dependent 70% on nuclear energy. Or that Sweden is dependent 48% on nuclear energy. Uh, so, there is a lot of ideology and power interests here, which go back to Hans Blix. I don't know whether that name says something to you, but also to the nuclear lobbies. Uh, but to come back to the church, 1674 was certainly an event which here in this city, in this church, in Utrecht, in Netherlands, was perceived as a universal event. Perhaps it was even perceived as, as sublime. Uh, so, uh, it, and it wasn't just, a, again, like the Notre Dame, it wasn't just an event which was happening here, it was an event which was a European event. Uh, so, according to one newspaper, in Brussels, hailstones fell which were as large as marbles. Many trees were removed from the earth, this is a quote, but also many house facades were overthrown. In Strasbourg, hailstones fell as large as babies' heads. If you walk down there to Utrecht, to the Dom's Cathedral, uh, you will see that the present look of the Dom Cathedral is a consequence of this big storm, which wasn't a tornado, but it's actually much more. It was, you know, I'm, I'm working on a book on the apocalypse now, so I'm reading really bizarre things, and I read a lot about meteorolo meteorology and such stuff, and especially meteorological uh, reconstructions of events. So I read also about this. And uh, uh, so, they, they, there are several accounts of farmers uh, who took cover as they saw that this frontal system was coming, and uh, they say that it lasted only for 15 minutes. And that's the interesting thing. So it's not just that, according to, to scientists and meteorologists, it's, it wasn't just a tornado. It is a, 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 it is a bow echo, which means that you have something like a storm which can range from 20 to 200 kilometers and is moving rapidly and is full of thunderstorms, is full of rain, of uh, uh, strong winds and so on. And that was the thing which hit Utrecht. Utrecht. Uh, uh, and it's complete opposite than Hurricane Dorian, if you, if you recall. Uh, Hurricane Dorian is interesting, be, which hit the, 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 the Grand Bahamas. It's interesting because it is the slowest ever storm recorded in human history. Uh, so it's opposite than Utrecht. Utrecht was this kind of quick thing, 15 minutes according to the accounts, and then it was finished and everything was more or less destroyed. Dorian is more like uh, um, Melancholia by Lars von Trier, you know? It's just there and it watches at you and you know that it's there and it moves. I think the, 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 they said that uh, uh, you could walk quicker than what Dorian was moving. 
In my worst obscene post-apocalyptic imagination, I imagine the apocalypse like that. Uh, uh, I mean, not the apocalypse, but the end of the world, you know, that it will just be this mega storm which is above us and it never disappears and then slowly we are just decaying and, and that's already happening today. Uh, uh, because the point is that you somewhere already the end of the world to someone is happening. Uh, uh, and that's the point with this, uh, slow, uh, with this small picture from this church 350 years ago. You could at the same time again imagine that uh, for, for the Dutch citizens it was the end of the world. Uh, but for someone in Croatia at that time, I mean, Croatia didn't even exist. I mean, now the nationalists would kill me if I said that, but in, 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 as a nation state, it didn't exist. Uh, what was happening at that time in Ecuador? What was happening, or what was important to people in Yemen at that time? Uh, uh, or in other cities, in Constantinopolis so and so on. So, and the same goes for, for, for Dorian. So my point with this is that with the apocalypse, you, always, uh, uh, you are always already on a certain ideological uh, position. And it is a class question, in which way you see the apocalypse, in which way you perceive the apocalypse, in which way you perceive something as a threat to humanity or to your little, small, selfish life. Uh, uh, so a beautiful example uh, of this shift of perspective uh, is given by, 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 by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu uh, in his book uh, uh, Distinction. Probably know about it, it's uh, a book from 79. Uh, it's called Distinction, a social critique of the judgment of taste, uh, where, he, where he poses the thesis that uh, uh, taste, and especially aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetical judgment, like because everything what we spoke about now is connected to a certain aesthetical judgment. Notre Dame burning is connected to the sublime. Uh, uh, Dorian, which reminds, reminds us on, the, on, on that, at, at least me, on that megastorm which is happening on Saturn, which is also disappearing, by the way. Uh, uh, so it's an aesthetical judgment. And what Pierre Bourdieu said is that uh, if you have a judgment like that, you are always already uh, uh, also have something what he calls distinction. Uh, which is a class distinction. Uh, uh, or to give you another very concrete example by another uh, uh, French, uh, one of my favorite French authors, Roland Barthes, uh, who in his auto autobiography, uh, so Barthes was an intellectual who was living most of his life with his mother in Paris. He was gay. Uh, he was uh, one of the most inspiring semioticians ever, I think. Uh, uh, and he had a pleasure in the text. And, uh, uh, but he, was, he always noticed things which other people wouldn't notice. Uh, so there is a paragraph in his autobiography where he spo speaks about coming back to the French village site where he came from before he became an intellectual, and he went to a bakery. And one morning when he visited this local bakery, uh, the woman in the bakery said, it's lovely but the heat is lasting too long. And you know what this intellectual from Paris, uh, Roland Barthes, answered? Uh, yeah, but the light is so beautiful. Uh, the woman doesn't answer, of course, and Roland Barthes noticed that a short, a, a short circuit in language of which the most trivial conversations are the sure occasion, I realized that seeing the light relates to class sensibility. What does it mean, you know, that uh, uh, he, I, I, I notice this perspective very often uh, on a certain Adriatic island where, where I spent a lot of time, unfortunately not enough, uh, where, you know, I, I had this episode, I, I uh, also came to a local shop there, you know, it's a very small community and I tell to one of my favorite uh, uh, ladies working in the, in the, in the, in the groceries, Oh, it's such a beautiful weather today, you know, we can swim all day and so on. Well, I immediately forgot that she's working all day. Uh, she said I didn't swim for 15 years. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to earn enough money so my, my kid can go to, to university. Uh, so, you know, this, th these are these situations where you encounter the class perspective and that seeing the light in something uh, uh, beautiful as a landscape, uh, beautiful as Notre Dame and so on, is a class perspective. And there is nothing more ideological than the weather itself. 
You know, I would put it like that. Uh, 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 and wouldn't the same apply to the apocalypse or the event which acquire a certain ap apocalyptic meaning, for instance, such as the burning of the Notre Dame? And I'm slowly finishing because I think the bell will ring soon. Uh, for instance, did, did the Yellow West in France perceive uh, uh, the fire which caught Notre Dame in the same way that uh, 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 the other people who were singing in front of it perceived it? Certainly not. Certainly they had a completely different perspective on the burning Notre Dame than Macron, for instance. <laughs> you know, because they were fighting against Macron, who was cutting, uh, who was, you know, rising. Same, similar situations that, as in Chile, which was mentioned at the beginning, that you have an increase, uh, either of public transport or gas. Transport, com mainly transport, uh, which shows that, yeah, we need a Green New Deal as soon as possible, because it is about transport, it is about fossil fuels, it is about this. Uh, so, the Yellow West certainly had a different perspective on, on, on the burning Notre Dame than Macron. And what you could have seen is that uh, within 48 hours, nearly a billion of euros was pledged for the reconstruction of the Notre Dame. Now, I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not uh, Duruti who says that the only good church uh, 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 is the one which is burning. Uh, uh, this is the, the, the anarchist, the, Spanish, the, the, the famous anarchist who said that. I'm not like that. Uh, 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 so, but my problem is not with the one billion euros uh, 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 which goes into the reconstruction of the Notre Dame. My problem is what we already mentioned, this is the misplaced empathy. Uh, it's misplaced empathy and it's very hypocritical when, so the, the Notre Dame was still burning and then Francois Pinot, the founder of the luxury goods group Caring, uh, said that he would pledge, uh, that he's offering 100 million euro, euros. And then came other, you know, mainly the French bourgeoisie, L'Oréal, and so on. Uh, but what was most interesting was an official statement by the French company Total. Uh, you probably know Total, right? Total, you know, Shell, Total, and so on. These are the same companies which are heavily responsible for the world uh, uh, galloping into a climate uh, catastrophe. So the statement of, of Total uh, was the following one. Uh, Total decided to make this donation because Notre Dame de Paris is an iconic monument that represents the group's French roots. It is a universal symbol of human aspiration and ingenuity. I can agree with all of that. Total's donation also demonstrates that the importance of standing together, the importance of standing together, which is one of the group's values, and the need to share in the outpouring of emotion and exceptional mobilization that this tragedy has triggered worldwide. The same as the New York article, you can already, if you know anything about reading ideology, you can already see ideology. Uh, uh, standing together, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, tragedy which was triggered worldwide and so on. But in order to deconstruct the ideology, and that's one of my main points today as well, that the apocalypse always has to be read from the lenses of the critique of ideology, is that, uh, 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 okay, just do the following thing. You heard the statement by Total. Now let's make a thought, ex which is about the Notre Dame. Now let's make a thought experiment and just imagine removing some words in their original statement. So it goes like this. Total decided to make this donation because the Amazon rainforest is an iconic monument to our planet's greatness. It is a universal symbol of nature's aspiration and ingenuity. Total's donation also demonstrates the importance of standing together, which is one of the group's values and the need to share in the outpouring of emotion and exceptional mobilization that this tragedy, the burning of the Amazon forest, rainforest, has triggered worldwide. Well, it is no wonder that this sounds like science fiction. It would be easier to imagine that Superman is flying over Brazil and helping the fire firefighters in Brazil than to imagine that Total would have such a statement to the Amazon forest. And here we make the full circle where we come back to Chernobyl. Uh, we come back to the very beginning when the architect at the Notre Dame says this is not Chernobyl. Uh, I think what he should have said is 
Simply, this is not the Amazon. But the problem would, of course, be that most of the people will think that he is thinking about a company and not a rainforest. So if you have Googled, as I did, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm completely mad, like I Google apocalypse every day. Uh, but uh, just to see what's happening, I mean, it's, it's amazing because then you can find out there is a vodka done in Chernobyl, uh, 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 then there is another one, uh, uh, then you have the Lego toys, you saw the Lego toys, uh, uh, Apocalypticburg. Uh, it's made something like that. I was somewhere in a duty free shop, and then you can see it. It's huge. It looks like the Statue of Liberty completely destroyed, like that beautiful beginning scene of uh, Planet of the Apes, you know, like this. Uh, and uh, it's an, a post apocalyptic toy for, for, for the children, where everything is ruined. It's post apocalypse, but you have a shop, you have surfers, and so on, but the air is polluted, and yeah, well. Uh, so you can see here as well that the apocalypse is being commodified in the sense that the children from very early age are already being educated in the sense to get. Uh, uh, accustomed to the idea that the world is such a world. You know that you get accustomed that in Belgrade these days uh, the air is so bad that children are not going out. Not New Delhi, Belgrade. And that this is connected directly to the, very, the, the, to the big divide between the center and the periphery of the European Union, where Germany, for instance, is going into Energiewende, uh, where in all these beautiful Western countries, uh, 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 which I love as well, uh, uh, you have a, a, a turn toward a sort of green transition, so people will drive uh, uh, electric cars and so on, but in the meantime, Germany will export millions and millions of diesel cars to Hungary, Poland, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia. And then you have the biggest number of premature deaths in Hungary, uh, not in China, because it's one of the most polluted countries in Europe as well. So we have all these kinds of, 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 of problems in the apocalypse. It's a class question in the end. Uh, so why do I think that the architect should have said that this is not the Amazon? Uh, because Notre Dame might be a sort of revelation, definitely. Uh, 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 it uh, might create a collect collective consciousness about the history and the significance, not only of a building which was, uh, for instance, uh, demolished during the French Revolution, where the coronation of Napoleon happened, and many, many significant historical events, and which has a big religious value to many people, mainly in the Western world, or touristic value, such as Chernobyl is getting now. Uh, uh, but he should have said, I think, the Amazon, because the Amazon forest for me and what's happening there, and this is not just the Amazon, it's about the microplastics, but it's difficult to see a revelation in microplastics because you, can, you cannot even see it, but this is the true revelation. So unfortunately, I think soon I will have to come to the end to respect the time which, we, which is still left. So I can take one more hour, huh? <laughs> yeah. A final statement. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I have to slow down a bit, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, my point today was there were several points, and it's an on, uh, it's a, and it's an ongoing work. Uh, but what I want to to examine, and I think it's really important, is uh, uh, the political, the ideological the semiotical, the linguistical undertones of the notion of the apocalypse. Uh, 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 precisely because I'm not a theologian, probably I would go in a different direction and examine the apocalypse in a different uh, 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 direction. But I think what we have to realize today, when the apocalypse is being commodified, you have, you know, the tools, uh, you have dark tourism, post-apocalyptic tourism. You know, there is even, not only Chernobyl one, there is in the Arctic now, you have tour, they cost a lot. Uh, 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 10 or 15,000 pounds or something like that, tours which are promoted as you go to a beautiful cruise ship and you see how the ice is melting, you will be the last one to see it. Uh, 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 so it's an interesting phenomenon, and it's not only an interesting phenomenon, the fact that everyone here, even those of you who didn't watch it, said that you heard about the HBO series uh, about Chernobyl, says something important about our times. Our times are, in my opinion, not apocalyptic times, but post-apocalyptic times. I think the revelation already happened. That would be uh, 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 my topic for next time in church. Next Sunday we meet here and we speak about uh, 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 the revelation. Uh, but I finish here. I hope I can return. Uh, thanks a lot, Miranda, for inviting me here. And thanks, everyone, for having this beautiful... Now you can turn it into wine. <laughs>
Thanks a lot.